Hello learners, I am Dr. Poonam Agrawal and in this short video I will be discussing regarding electron transport chain and the process which is going on there that is oxidative phosphorylation. So what is electron transport chain? Electron transport chain is the set of enzyme complexes. There are total 5 enzyme complexes which are present on inner mitochondrial membrane. For example, if you are talking about mitochondria, if this is inner membrane mitochondria, this is outer membrane and this is inner membrane mitochondria, you have a space, intermembranous space in between. The five complexes of electron transport chain which I am mentioning is all present at inner membrane of mitochondria. You have five complexes, you can see complex 1 to complex 4 they act as a unit and there is one more complex that's complex 5 which act in unison with complex 1 to complex 4. Complex 1 to complex 4 they are knob like particles which are present on inner membrane they are dust like particle and complex 5 is the channel forming enzyme complex which is present on inner membrane it's forming you a channel which is connecting the space to the matrix so this is the complex 5 which is connecting the space to the matrix so we have total five complexes on electron transport chain complex 1 to complex 4 they are dust like particle knob like particle which are not making any perforation or channel in the inner membrane but complex 5 is making the channel in the inner membrane complex 1 to complex 4 is involved in the process of oxidation and complex 5 is involved in the process of phosphorylation oxidation of NADH and FADH2 and uh, phosphorylation means formation of ATP so we see a very good interlink between the complex 1 to complex 4 and the complex 5 more the complex 1 to complex 4 is functioning more the complex 5 is going to function so more the oxidation more the phosphorylation is going to take place on this electron transport chain now these four complexes i'm going to discuss you first followed by their functional aspect then I'll be discussing about complex 5, it's a structural organization on inner membrane and then it's functional aspect. So let's start with the discussion and if you see this is the technical picture which is showing you the complexity of this electron transport chain. So this is the electron transport chain. You can see multi subunit complexes. This is complex 1, this complex 2, this is complex 3, this is complex 4 and you can see the complex 5 presented here. So I am just going to discuss these complexes one by one. First of all, I will be talking to you from complex 1 to complex 4 and we will discuss its role. And then after that, I will be talking about the complex 5. It's a structural organization and its location in the inner membrane, its uh, arrangement in the inner membrane. And then I will be telling you how the action of complex 1 to complex 4 is determining the action of complex 5. So. To simplify, if I draw the inner membrane in this fashion, this is inner membrane mitochondria. This is the space in between the outer and inner membrane of mitochondria. This is the matrix of mitochondria. It is very important that you know the clear demarcation of various compartments in the mitochondria now when i am telling you complex 1 to complex 4 they are arranged on inner membrane this is complex 1 and uh, you have complex 2 over here then you have complex 3 they are sequentially arranged like this then you have complex 4 arranged here like this this is complex 4 right so the complex 1 is having FMN and iron sulfur center. Similarly, complex 3 is having cytochrome B, cytochrome C1 and iron sulfur center. Complex 4 is having cytochrome A, cytochrome A3, copper A and copper B as a component of it. If you talk about complex 2, it is having FAD. 
is part of it. Now, these complexes are actually arranged in this fashion on inner membrane. They are multi subunit, as I have told you. The order of, and in addition to these complexes, you have certain free component or otherwise called the mobile component of ETC. They are called coenzyme Q and then you have cytochrome C. So in between complex 2 and uh, uh, in fact, if I tell you complex 2 is present in this fashion and uh, and coenzyme Q you can see is actually surrounded by all the three complexes, complex 1, complex 2, complex 3. All these complexes are arranged in order of their increasing redox potential, increasing redox potential. Redox potential. What is redox potential? It's an electron transferring capability. If you talk about complex 1, the donor of reducing equivalent here is NADH. And if you talk about complex 2, the donor of reducing equivalent is FATH2 here. If you talk about redox potential of NADH, the electron donating capacity, it is having the redox potential of minus 0.32 voltage. The terminal component is oxygen atom, which is final acceptor of electron on this electron transport chain that's making you water. And the redox potential of this oxygen atom is, you need to remember, it is plus 0.82 voltage. So if you see progressively, the redox potential is increasing from minus 0.32 voltage to plus 0.82 voltage. The components are arranged in order of increasing redox potential. Redox potential is electron donating capacity. If any component is having the redox potential in negative, it will tend to donate the electron. And if any component is having the redox potential in positive, it will readily accept the electron. So you understand that on this complex, the electron flow will be from complex 1 to oxygen atom. And as I have told you already, the donor of reducing equivalent at complex 1 is NADH and it's proton. It donates proton as well as electron into the complex 1, which is then being transferred to coenzyme Q, which is then given to cytochrome B and then C1 of complex 3, which is then being given to cytochrome C and then to the complex 4 with cytochrome E e and e3 are going to accept it first e and then e3 and then finally that reducing equivalent is going to go to the oxygen atom which is going to get reduced to water this is the flow of electron this green color line is actually telling you the flow of reducing equivalent electron towards the oxygen atom when the donor is nadh if fadh2 is the donor on the other hand see the direction of the movement of reducing equivalent it will first come to complex 2 and then from here to coenzyme q then to complex 3 components then cytochrome c then complex 4 then to the oxygen atom and then to the water molecule you understand very clearly that when nadh is the donor the complex which is bypassed is the complex 2 and when FADH2 is the donor of reducing equivalent, the complex which is bypassed in the flow of electron is the complex 1. Complex 3 and complex 4 are common complexes. They are always encountered. Coenzyme Q is always encountered and cytochrome C is always encountered. Oxygen is always the terminal acceptor of electron. I repeat once again, if NADH is the donor of reducing equivalent, complex 2 is not encountered in the flow of electron. It's bypassed. Similarly, when FEDH2 is the donor of reducing equivalent, the complex 1 is not encountered. It's bypassed. And complex 3, complex 4, coenzyme Q, cytochrome C, and oxygen, they're common material. They are encountered. They're needed um, when the NADH is the donor as well as when the FEDH2 is the donor of reducing equivalent. So this you have seen the various complexes which are present at electron transport chain and their particular order. And then you have seen that how the flow of electron is taking place towards the oxygen atom. This coenzyme Q is also called ubiquinone. You should know ubiquinone. This is 
ubiquinone, which is produced by farnesyl pyrophosphate, which is intermediate of cholesterol biosynthesis. They're called mobile complexes of ETC. What is mobile component of ETC? Coenzyme Q and cytochrome C. They're called mobile component of ETC because they are not the part of any complex on electron transport chain. They're free. The coenzyme Q is accepting the reducing equivalent from one as well as from two and giving it to three. And cyt uh, cytochrome C, you can see in this picture, is accepting the reducing equivalent from three and giving it to four. So they act as a carrier of electron which is being transferred from one particular complex to the next one in the series. One more thing you should know that all these complexes, enzyme complexes, one, two, three, four, they all belong to class one of enzyme classification. What is class one of enzyme classification? It's a oxidoreductase class of enzyme, oxidoreductase class of enzyme. All these complexes, one, two, three, four, they are belonging to class one of enzyme classification. They all are oxidoreductase. What is oxidoreductase? The enzymes which are capable of oxidizing and reducing both simultaneously, which are involved in transfer of hydrogen and electron from one component to the other. The one which is donating the pro uh, hydrogen and electron, it's getting oxidized and the one which is accepting the hydrogen and electron is getting reduced. So the oxidoreductase class of enzyme is doing two things simultaneously, oxidation and reduction. The same thing is being done by these complexes. If you see complex one, when it is uh, transferring the electron from NADH to coenzyme Q, then what is happening? The NADH is getting oxidized to NAD and coenzyme Q is getting reduced with that electron. Similar fashion when complex 3 is accepting the electron from coenzyme Q and giving it to cytochrome C, the coenzyme Q is getting oxidized and cytochrome C is getting reduced. And similarly, when complex 4 is taking the reducing equivalent from cytochrome C and giving it to oxygen atom, then again oxidoreduction is taking place. And because especially it is giving it to oxygen atom, we call it as oxidase. Oxidase is one subclass of oxidoreductase. So now let's nomenclate these various complexes on electron transport chain. Complex 1, complex 2, complex 3 and complex 4. Based on their function, they are nomenclated. Complex 1, because it is accepting the reducing equivalent from NADH and giving it to coenzyme Q, you can call it as NADH coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. NADH coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. Complex 2, what it is doing? It is taking the reducing equivalent from FADH2 and giving it to coenzyme Q. You can call it as FADH2 coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. You can also call it as complex 2 as succinate coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. Succinate coenzyme Q oxidoreductase because succinate dehydrogenase enzyme, which is an uh, enzyme of TCA cycle, is acting on succinate and dehydrogenating it to produce you FADH2, which is an important entry in this complex 2. So, based on that substrate succinate, uh, at times this is named as succinate coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. Similar fashion, if you deem the complex 3, what it is doing, you have to see its role. Complex 3 is taking the reducing equivalent from coenzyme Q and giving it to cytochrome C. So it can be called as coenzyme Q cytochrome C oxidoreductase. Coenzyme Q cytochrome C oxidoreductase. Complex 4, it's called cytochrome C oxidase because oxidase means the oxidoreductase which is transferring the reducing equivalent directly to oxygen atom and that is what a complex 4 is doing. It is taking the reducing equivalent from cytochrome C and donating it to oxygen atom. So the complex 4 is called cytochrome C oxidase. So this is how you nomenclate all the four enzyme complexes on electron transport chain. And their role is oxidation of NADH and FADH2. And I have told you how the entry of NADH will be there at complex 1 and how the entry of FADH2 is going to be there on at complex 2 by passing one particular complex each time. 
The common complexes 3 and 4, coenzyme Q and cytochrome C are always encountered. Now, what is the gain of this oxidation which is taking place here? When NADH and FADH2 are oxidized, then what is the benefit to the cell? What actually is the end result of this transportation of electron on this ETC? The end result is proton accumulation in the space, in the intermembranous space. Proton accumulation in the intermembranous space. See, when the complex 1 is transferring the reducing equivalent from NADH to coenzyme Q, because the redox potential is progressively increasing, it is going towards the positive direction you should understand this coenzyme q is having the redox potential of positivity right so from negative to positive the electron is moving negative is the one which is donating the electron and the positive is one which is able to catch hold the electron is let's say avid acceptor of electron so coenzyme q is a better acceptor of electron compared to nadh so the amount of energy which is needed for coenzyme q to catch hold that electron uh, is much lesser because anyway it is the ideal acceptor of electron compared to nadh and nadh was holding the electron with lot of external energy i should say so when the electron is flowing from nadh to coenzyme q the electron is going to its favorable acceptor so some amount of energy is released at this point similar fashion at complex 3 also some amount of energy is released because electron is moved to the uh, favorable acceptor which is cytochrome c in this case Similarly, complex 4 is transferring the electron to oxygen atom, which is an avid acceptor of electron because its redox potential is in positive. So, what I in nutshell I mean to say that when electron is moving on electron transport chain, the energy is released at complex 1, at complex 3, and at complex 4. This energy which is released at complex 1 is able to push 4 proton in this piece similar fashion the complex three four protons are pushed in the intermembranous space and at complex four you have two protons which are pushed at intermembranous space fadh2 when entering the complex two and when it is being transferred to coenzyme q enough energy is not released so none of the proton is going outside but the same reducing equivalent from FADH2 when traversing the complex 3 and complex 4, you tend to have 4 and 2 protons in the space. So what do you understand here? When the NADH is the donor of reducing equivalent, you have 10 protons accumulating in the space. When NADH is the donor of reducing equivalent, you have 10 protons in the space. And when FADH2 is the reducing uh, donor of reducing equivalent, you have 6 protons in the space. You have lesser number of protons in the space when FADH2 is the donor of reducing equivalent. This proton which is accumulated comes back to the matrix via complex 5. There comes the role of complex 5. I said you have one complex 5 also on inner membrane which is having a very typical structure which I will be showing you. This is complex 5 which is having hollowness, which is having a passage. It's a channel which is having a passage which is allowing the proton entry to the matrix. So this proton is going to come back to the matrix and this complex 5 in this process produces you ATP in the matrix itself. They say four proton needed for making of one ATP. So 10 protons can make you 2.5 ATP and six protons can make you 1.5 ATP. And that is the calculation you always apply that NADH is producing you 2.5 ATP and FADH2 is producing you 1.5 ATP. It is all because their number of protons which is accumulated is such that they are capable of providing you 2.5 and 1.5 ATP once these protons they come back to the matrix via complex 5. So now let's focus on complex 5. How is its structure? It's a multi subunit complex and you can see this picture which is showing you the picture of complex 5. This complete structure is the complex 5. You can see two portion, one is FO, another portion, bulky portion is called F1. So complex 5 can be uh, divided into 
two portions one is f o and one is f1 if anyone ask you which portion of complex 5 is traversing the inner membrane of mitochondria you have to call it as f o and f1 is the portion of complex 5 which is actually protruding in the matrix of the mitochondria it's a bulky portion knob like particle protruding in the matrix of the mitochondria you can see in this picture that f o is made up of multiple c subunits which are encircling the gamma subunit of f1 gamma subunit is the hollow subunit of complex 5 which is providing the channel for entry of proton back to the matrix and around this gamma stem you have three alpha and three beta alternatively arranged so this gamma is providing the channel for the proton and the proton is entering the matrix of the mitochondria during this process what happens the gamma is rotated so gamma which subunit is rotated it's a gamma subunit which is rotated on its own axis during flow of proton this rotation of gamma imparts catalytic activity to beta subunit slight rotation imparts the catalytic activity to one beta subunit and some more rotation of gamma provides the catalytic activity to another beta subunit some more rotation provides the catalytic activity to third beta subunit what is that catalytic activity which is induced to, due to rotation of this gamma which is due to flow of protons back to the matrix the name of that catalytic activity which is induced in beta subunit is the ATP synthase activity. So now you understand that once the proton is flowing back to the matrix because of proton motive force which is generated across the inner membrane. I have told you a lot of protons are accumulated. So this is going to generate a gradient across the inner membrane. More proton in the space, less proton in the matrix. So that's called proton motive force. Because of this proton motive force, the proton are going to use the gamma channel hollowness and going to come back to the matrix. During this process, they rotate the gamma and uh, rotation of gamma induces the catalytic activity in beta and that is ATP synthase activity which is induced in beta. One beta is capable of making you one ATP. Right, right, ADP and inorganic phosphate is required, makes you one ATP. Another beta makes you another one ATP and one more beta is there if that is catalytically induced that again is making you one ATP. So one complete 360 degree rotation of gamma subunit gives you three ATP in the matrix of the mitochondria. So now you see they have calculated energetically that four protons are needed for making you, you one ATP and complete uh, 360 degree rotation of gamma in gives you three ATP because there are three beta subunits in F1 uh, portion of the complex five and each beta is capable of making you only one ATP. It's a transient activity which is induced ATP synthase activity. So after making one ATP, its activity is lost. So it's a transient activity which is induced in beta. So three beta when catalytically induced, you tend to have three ATP. So these things you should know that the oxidation process is responsible for the phosphorylation in the complex 5 and the, where what is the site of ATP production it's a matrix of mitochondria so more the oxidation more the protons and more the formation of ATP right so more the oxidation more the phosphorylation it's called oxidative phosphorylation oxidative for what we are discussing is the oxidative phosphorylation which is explaining the mechanism how the oxidation and phosphorylation is a coupled process and what all I have explained you is the chemio is the chemio osmotic model of Peter Mitchell. Scientist Peter Mitchell proposed this model and this is called chemio osmotic model for oxidative phosphorylation which is responsible for making of ATP in the matrix of the mitochondria. That is how that is all but you and uh, this is how the oxidative phosphorylation you have to learn. It's a coupled process because more the oxidation, more the phosphorylation is going to take place. And uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria is completely a closed channel except these complex fives, uh, which is actually making uh, the channel on the inner membrane. I said the inner membrane is a completely closed membrane except these channels, which are catalytic channels, which are meant for 
permeability for entry of these protons back to the matrix. Thank you very much. And for more such videos, you can subscribe my channel, Dr. Poonam Agarwal. Thank you.